Okay, we could talk a little casually still as people, the door opens up and some people will come in. But um, so, uh, so you're there through August. Hey, everybody who's starting to roll in, welcome to this week's edition of What's Your Story from the Gather Project. Um, most of you will know by now that the Gather Project uh, is an experiment that we started in order to connect people who love film college students have uh, come and really gathered to create a whole bunch of fun programming. And this particular one, uh, What's Your Story, is about people's career paths. Uh, we're really excited to have Buddy and Wright uh, today. Happy birthday, Buddy. <laughs> and Buddy is, uh, um, has a, had a long career in production and is a, a producer doing a, all kinds of fun projects, which I know we'll get into they including Borat, which you so gratefully came and did a Q&A on that experience. But today we'll be talking about careers. So really excited about that. Um, doing the moderating today will be Chris. Uh, Chris, how do you pronounce your last name? I should have, Duyos? Duyos, yeah, you got it. <laughs> Duyos, all right. So Chris Duyos from Tufts, uh, about to graduate. So venturing out into the world. And I'm, I'm excited for this because uh, you've got some great questions. Um, I will turn myself off in a second, but again, for those who are new, check out gatherproject.net and uh, to see everything that uh, else that we're doing and some of the upcoming programs. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and Buddy and Buddy, I'll pop back on at the end. Uh, we can do some recap and some catch up then, but um, Chris, thanks a ton and you guys have fun. Thanks Kevin. Hi Chris. Hi everybody. Hi buddy. Um, I'm so excited to be talking with you today. Uh, like, uh, like Kevin said, my name is Chris. I'm a, I'm a senior at Tufts uh, with a double major in film and media studies and international relations. And uh, yeah, I've been obsessed with movies since I was a little kid, um, like, like Jurassic Park, Star Wars, all that stuff. And then I, you know, as I got older, I got more into it and started to think of it as a career. And so I majored in film and, and now I, like many people in Gather and, in, you know, throughout the country are, um, I'm really interested in looking for like entry level jobs in the industry. And so I'm really excited to be talking with you because I know you started as a PA and you've worked your way up now to be a producer. You've been an executive for a bit. So really excited to talk with you about your career today. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Happy yeah. to be here. Um, so my first question for you is, uh, was there a, a film or television show that you watched um, that motivated you to work in the ent entertainment industry? Uh, yeah, it, it, great question. Uh, it, it, I watched Blade Runner in 82, I guess, show of hands. I don't know. I think 82. Um, I was still in college. Uh, I went to Bard. I was uh, uh, started as a biology major and finished as a fine arts major. I know that's a crazy, crazy trajectory that like millions of people have taken. Um, I was a photography major. I wasn't a film major. Um, and I always loved the magic of cinema. Um, I, I remember, uh, I'm old, but I remember when my dad took me to see The Sound of Music at the Kuhio Theater in Honolulu, I think it was five or six, and just, just walking into that place and the lights went off and, um, uh, you know, uh, seeing 2001. But when I saw Blade Runner and I was trying to figure out what am I gonna do when I get out of school, uh, because, uh, you know, I had, a, I, I was a liberal arts major, I was a humanities student, and um, that probably made me a good critical thinker, um, but it, it made me what, what now is, I think, called a generalist, and our, uh, our, our society really wants to organize everybody into verticals, and even back then, I just didn't fit in a vertical, and um, I wanted to be in, f in filmmaking, I didn't know what that meant. Um, Blade Runner inspired me. The Godfather inspired me. Um, uh, Sound of Music is still one of my favorite movies ever. I just think it's awesome. Uh, and I loved all the John Hughes movies. They really made, uh, made a difference. And uh, Little Darlings that were coming out in the 80s, um, I think it was the 80s, like Say Anything. And um, there, were, there were just some, you know, Sid and Nancy. There was, there was a great time for independent filmmaking. Um, the business was really locked up still. There wasn't uh, uh, the, the, the distribution that there is now. So independent filmmakers were independent. Um, 
So I didn't know what to do and it, it inspired me. I went to LA and um, I got a job. I got a job as a PA. Here I am in Toronto, 35 years later, which, which wasn't the plan by the way. May I ask what was the plan <laughs> besides biology? <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I don't think I had a plan. The plan was I needed a job and I wanted to pay the rent and um, my friend, asked if I wanted to be a PA and I said, sure, kind of what's that? And then food showed up at lunch and um, then we were finished every day and there was breakfast the next morning and I was working with actors. My first movie, Charlie Sheen starred in, nobody knew who he was. Penelope Spheres directed it, um, nobody knew who she was. She did Suburbia right before that. Um, a guy named Dan Bradley was the stunt coordinator. Now he's like one of the biggest second unit directors in the world. Fade on Papa Michael was one of the camera assistants and now he's one of the greatest DPs you can hire. So we were all there doing this non-union million dollar movie shooting all night long in LA. And I just couldn't believe how lucky I was. It was like magic. Um, you know, I, I, there's, there's, there, I, we, we talk about having a calling. Like I really felt like, you know, I was, I was chasing a religion and wanted to be a part of it in a way, if that makes sense. Um, and I loved it and I loved the hard work and I loved the long hours and I, I, I wasn't going to fit in a box job wise. And so that was good for me. It was a good fit. That's great. Yeah. I think I would also describe myself as a generalist. And I think there's a lot of, uh, I think a lot of people that could relate to this. Um, uh, and yeah, no, I completely understand that. Um, it's very interesting. Um, were there any experience like uh this pa job did it come did it happen in college did it did it happen afterwards did it like were, were there any experiences in college that kind of set you on the pa path or was it was it really more of just like your friend calling you up one day um good question uh, in college some of my friends in the film department made some films and we all got to be in them um we went to the drama department rated the costume I don't know what that was, locker, bin, wardrobe room. I don't know what the actors call it. And I like that. And we were all learning what a grip was and electric, but it was pretty informal. I mean, it was barred in the eighties. It was pretty renegade. Um, it was cool though, but our our cr critical film training was, was uh, you know, Kenneth Anger and D.A. Pennybacker and, um, Salvador Dali, and you know, it was it was it was, it was pretty avant garde, pretty out there, um, which which I dug. Um, again, you know, critical thinking and art. Um, so I didn't. I don't think I knew what a PA was. I think I knew what a gopher was because I worked for a photographer one summer, and I was the gopher. I went go for this, go for that. But I went to LA to visit a friend uh, from college. I didn't have a job, didn't have a plan. I was sleeping on his couch. He was working on a movie, and. Um, after a couple of weeks of me not doing anything all day because he was working, he finally said, do you want a job as a PA? And I, I'm sure I said, what's that? And he said, well, just come and you do whatever needs to get done. And, uh, you know, it's the gateway drug. If, if, if you're going to get high on this business, it really is the gateway drug because, you know, the, 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 the universe opens up and you get to say, for me at least, being very naive in the strictest sense, naive being new, you know, I got to see how camera worked and I got to see, you know, oh, those truck drivers, that's a job. And uh, got to see the caterer, he had a job too. And makeup and hair and just the whole, what is the, a that guy, the AD, why is he yelling at me? You know, cause I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so uh, I, I just, I, I got to see everything happen. And, and again, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe how lucky I was and I was getting paid, which I really couldn't believe because I probably would have done it for free because it was that much fun for me. And, um, uh, you know, it still is, it still is a lot of fun. It's a lot, it's hard work, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, getting paid to work on a set is kind of, uh, kind of like the best of both worlds. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. What a, <laughs> like, what a great story to just have like stumbled upon it. Um, and really find, find your calling, I guess. Um, yeah, as like entering as a PA, uh, you said that you like, you got to see all the like, moving parts of it and stuff. Uh, how else did it like set you up for your career? Like what lessons did you learn from being a production assistant? Like, 
challenges or rewards or any of it? Uh, within a couple of shows, one of the ADs who liked me, who I worked with a lot, um, labeled me as the executive PA. And I thought that was really flattering. I thought that meant like, oh, I got a promotion. Um, what I think he saw was I was really good at telling other people what to do, um, including the PAs who in theory, we were all equal. So I look back at it now and chuckle. Um, you know, I think we all have kind of our skill sets, maybe our interests and our abilities. And um, I was realizing that sure, I could sweep and I could take out the garbage leaking from the caterer into the truck every night. And there's a lot of gross monkey business you have to do. Um, but that I was quickly learning that if I, I have to make some kind of decision and maybe throw down and declare something else that I want to do um, because you don't want, you don't want to be a professional PAs. PA. By the way, there are professional PAs out there and they're, they're like professional PAs and it, it's kind of like being a professional grocery bagger. Like that wasn't supposed to be a, a career. That was supposed to be like a summer job. You know what I mean? So um, uh, I was told very early, I had an uncle, the only person in my family who was in the business, he worked for public television and he was a camera guy and a director. Um, not at all a movie guy, not at all even a real TV guy, but you know, heart and soul, lived in Pittsburgh, worked with Fred Rogers, like did super, super cool stuff. Um, Kennedy Center, all sorts of really cool things for WGBH. But he said, you know, his advice to me, which I would still tell anybody was, as long as you can take any job people offer you, because you're going to learn how a, a project gets made. You're going to learn how a project gets produced. So if somebody says to you, you know, do you want to drive a truck? Just say, sure. Yeah. And then you may discover, I don't ever want to do this again, but that's a really valuable lesson. And the same is true. Like I thought the, the grips were having fun. And so I was a grip for a while. And then I realized they're having fun because they're not the electricians they don't want to be wrapping cable an hour after everybody goes home every night. Um, and both of those are very hard manual labor jobs. And, uh, you know, I couldn't see a path for me for ambition or for aspiration out of that. So by doing those, I, I started to learn that they weren't going to serve me if I wanted to, um, you know, punch out. And where I wanted to punch up to is I wanted to be a location manager. That seemed really cool to me. And it was, I loved it. Um, I saw the location managers. I realized they had adventure. They got to go out early. You know, the, if you don't know, a location manager gets a script. Usually it's about the same time a production designer is hired. And together with the director, you get to go build the world of your movie. Um, and you, you, get to, you get to do all this work that for me was, was grounded in, in research because I really wanted to understand um, the, the world, whether it was the architecture or the period, um, the, the social culture stuff that was going on with the characters who were living in this house or working in this building. I got to put my photography to good work. I loved it when people said, wow, you, you're a better photographer than most you know, location managers. Um, so I got to be part of the storytelling process. And I started realizing that this is where I want to be is I want to be in, in support of the storytellers. And um, you know, I, I wasn't a writer. Um, I think like lots of people, I thought, you know, I'm probably a writer, but I, I was a good, I was a good teller, but I'm not a writer. I could, I'm a guy who wants to tell you a story, not make the story. Um, so I love being a location manager. And that's what the PA kind of job got me to springboard to. Um, and it was fun. It started getting me out of town. I started going on location. And that felt like I was getting a paid vacation um, going to Arizona or San Diego or someplace. Yeah, I uh, I was a producer for a class a few years ago, and I um, my favorite part of the class was doing location scouting and just like and it was a period piece too. So I got to like research like 1890s Massachusetts architecture, and I had to like yeah. go to sites and see if they would fit. And that that is actually like the coolest thing ever. So I I relate to that. <laughs> yeah. um, hey, by the way, I should tell you, I love it when the circle gets closed. So when I was scouting locations downtown LA before people lived there, um, it was you know full Blade Runner land down there, and um, 
I actually got to get into the Bradbury building, which is where all the wrought iron is and the water drips down. I mean, I got into that. Um, I, I got to go into the Ennis Brown house, which is where Mr. The bull, what's his name? Tetro, Tetro lives, the, the you know, the, the, the corporate guy. Um, I got to go into William Mulholland's offices that were just locked up in a building like that was abandoned. So I got to just, I got to get into the guts of the city that 8 million people who live there have never seen. It was super cool. So to your point, yeah, like, but I got to, I got to get back into my Blade Runner roots, which, which I loved. That, that is very cool. I love yeah. like the, that, that period uh, or just like movies that are kind of about LA, like Blade Runner, I know it takes place in the future, but for, what comes to mind is like Chinatown. I'm thinking about like totally. Mulholland and like this, the birth of LA and stuff. And I think I that's like, it was, it was cool. That yeah. is, yeah, no, as, as a, I guess, I guess I'm a locations nerd. I, I didn't know that was a thing, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's very cool to hear. Um, I was wondering, how did you, you mentioned you didn't want to become a professional PA and you didn't want to like go into being a grip or an electrician and, and you wanted to be a location manager and eventually you, you started in that. How did that specifically happen? What, like, what was the story that like led you to break uh, through from PA to location manager? I'd be great if it was a breakthrough. I, I don't know if it was as dramatic as that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, um, in, in our business, probably like most others, you, you rise with your peers, whether you know it or not, it's going to happen. You know, you're floating on the tide. And um, if you don't think it's going to happen, you're wrong. Like you stick around long enough, you turn around and realize, oh, all the people that I started with are still here and they're all doing stuff. And look, one of them got nominated for an Oscar and look, another one's running a studio. And I mean, it, it just happens if you don't quit before the miracle and you're good at your job, you keep going up. And the other thing that happens is it's kind of a different version of people buy from people like the old salesman's jargon, you know? Um, but we all just have a network. And uh, one of the movies that I PA'd on, um, there was a guy on it. He got on another movie um, and they were going to Arizona and they needed a location manager. And uh, I think he told the producer, I know a guy and I don't know what he said about me. Probably it was, I think he could handle it or uh, something. Anyway, uh, the producer called me and said, do you want to do it? And I said, oh yeah, you know, go to Arizona. That sounds great. And um, it, it was, uh, uh, I, I won't forget it because of what happened. So she said to me, she's still working. She's, she's a successful producer herself. And uh, I was making $60 a day as a producer, $300, $300 a week. Um, and I thought that was pretty good money. Um, and I was working like 16 hour days. Anyway, she said, so how much do you want? And I looked at her and I said, $100 a day. And she went, you're hired. Only then did I realize that location managers got paid, I don't know, three, four, five times that a day. And I found out like four weeks later, I went back to her and I said, hey, I made a really bad deal and you knew it and took it. And she said, yeah, but you made your deal. And, uh, you know, I think you have two choices here. You're going to honor your deal and do a good job or let me know if you're not going to, you know, stick around. So, um, you know, it worked because it wasn't at all a Faustian deal. I had a really good time on the show and I learned a lot, met a lot of great people. Um, and uh, I did a good enough job on that show that somebody, they fin people were finishing up and they said, we got another show, do you want to do it? And that just, just kind of keeps happening. You just kind of become a, a Velcro ball or a dust ball and just keep picking up speed, you know, picking things up. I like that metaphor. <laughs> I like the tied one too. I feel like, yeah, I, I've just heard of so, I mean, like it's kind of infamous, just like struggling with the jobs and like considering, you know, like quitting or trying it out for a few years and see what happens. That's what I've heard from like a lot of people, at least, at least these days, but. Chloe um, Zhao, I promise you Chloe Zhao and her husband, the DP, like they, it wasn't long ago that they, they have the same story. I promise you, I promise yeah. you, you know, you just stick around long enough and, hang out with people you like and um, inspire each other. Now Chloe Zhao runs Hollywood, so. <laughs> I think she did um, a Marvel movie. 
Yeah, she has a bit. I think it's a it's supposed to be like a really big one coming out uh, later this year. I'm excited for mm -hmm. it. Crazy. Anyway, yeah. we digress. Yeah. Um, so how did um, so like. I guess we've already talked about like line or location manager responsibilities. Um, were there like, was there any particular locations that were, I know you mentioned Arizona, um, were there, was there any location that was like particularly interesting to you or like outside of LA or, or anything like that? No, I mean, maybe you're asking like, there's that thing on deadline, the film that lit my fire. You ever see that on deadline? Like they interview people about the movies that inspired them. Um, you know, one of the great things for me about being a location manager is um, I really got to see like how uh, the early process of production um, comes together. And if it doesn't come together, your show's a, a mess. And um, it's, it's really hard, really hard and really expensive to recover from um, a show that's not well prepared and started. Um, once you have all those people on, they, nobody just says, okay, let us, we're going to just not come to work for three days. Let us know what you decide. Um, you know, the, the clock is running and the bank is pouring money out. Um, so um, uh, I, I started doing bigger and bigger movies and I, and, and I stayed in the indie world, kind of the indie art world. I did this movie um, that was called, uh, I think it was released as the Arrowtooth Waltz or Arizona, no, Arizona Dreams. And this famous um, Bosnian director named Amir Kustarica, Kustarica directed it. He just won an Oscar for a movie called When Father Was Away on Business. And um, it was this, at the time, really big indie. It was a $20 million indie that was financed out of France. And it was Jerry Lewis and Faye Dunaway and Johnny Depp and Lily Taylor and Paulina Porskova and Vincent Gallo. I mean, this really crazy cool cast. And um, it was crazy, bizarre, independent movie that only a European could have expected would get financed because it had nothing commercial about it. And they got 20 million bucks and it took place in the Arizona desert and um, the art above the Arctic Circle in Alaska in wintertime. Yeah, both those places. And I was the location manager. So it was awesome because I got to spend five or six months on the Arizona border in a border town in Arizona, in, in Arizona a place called Douglas. Um, and, you know, met super interesting ranchers and just local people in all these like old um, uh, boom towns that had fallen on bad times. And then I got to go to Nome, Alaska in February. Uh, and we got all kitted up and um, 12 or 13 of us went and it was February above the Arctic Circle, like nothing I'd ever seen or experienced. And we were the filmmakers showing up in Nome where, by the way, there's no film industry there. Um, like not, there's less than zero film industry there. And finding some people, you know, we found somebody that has a bus that was emptied out, but had a pot bellied stove in it. So that was like our warming thing and we could drive that. And um, we hired um, some of the local um, Native Alaskans, Native Americans, um, no disrespect to anybody. Um, and uh, they helped us as crew. And one day we turned around, it was 30 below zero and like 40 mile an hour winds and we're shooting and we couldn't find any of the, the people that we had to help us. They were in our warming tent and we said, why don't you come out? And they said, we don't go out in this kind of weather. Like you guys are fools. <laughs> So um, it was a really cool experience. It was like nine months of Arizona, Colorado, Alaska. And I have to say, I, I haven't seen the world, but it's, I'm, I'm really good with adventure. I'm really good with being, you know, boots on the ground, first one in, getting to a place, having to figure it out. Um, kind of in, you know, in North America or uh, I've recently been to Serbia or Romania and that was cool or England. Yeah. So it's really fun. I love that. I love being out there and being really independent of, of the rest of the company too. That is like so cool. Just like all those locations just for one project too. Yeah. Yeah. I, it sounds like a definitely a, I mean, the between the snowstorm and then I'm guessing you probably had like, I don't know, sandstorm or like oh, yeah. it was awful nuts. heat in Arizona, just the two like extremes. It's just like, yeah. I've been that, hilarious but also kind of 
really cool too. Something I have I'm a friend, he's a location manager. He's been doing it for a long time. He does like all of David Fincher's shows and he's, he's a producer now, but he's, he's hired all the time by studios and networks to go around the world and figure out where to do a movie or where, you know, like not literally, but like Mission Impossible has to shoot in five countries scripted. So he'll go to five Arabs, three Arab nations and, and five Asian nations and then put this whole kind of ecosystem together for the project to present to the studio to make it work, which is, if you ask me, just kind of like the ultimate location manager job, you know, you know what has to happen and you know how to make it happen. Um, so that's kind of a cool version of what I was talking about. I mean, I, I think your version sounds cool, but also yeah. like doing a tent pole that shoots in like six countries. Like oh, yeah. I know the last yeah. Mission Impossible was like in Norway, England, like uh, France, United Arab Emirates. Like that's just crazy. Yeah. To me. yeah. Um, but yeah. So my next question is, I was wondering how did um, being a location manager lead, lead into becoming a line producer? Like how did that transition? Yeah. Kind of yeah. Uh, well, um, it's, it's not an unusual path. Um, typically, um, maybe the, the layer in between is a production manager, a unit production manager, um, which uh, is a, a director's guild position. I was never um, in Los Angeles, the location managers are covered by the Teamsters Union. And um, I wasn't at a point, I was young enough where I wasn't thinking I'm married, I got kids, I need to have you know, health insurance and all that great stuff that a union and guild um, does provide and I'm, I'm very pro-union and pro-guild. I think they, they, they protect all of us from being exploited because, you know, it's really hard negotiating for yourself and it also just makes things easier for producers. If, if you just have like a bunch of rules and say, we can hire everybody and here's the rules, it makes it kind of easier. So um, I, I, was, I was topping out kind of with a ceiling. I wasn't going to make any more and money per week or per year. And um, I was working on a Michael Mann pilot for NBC. And I was working with a really experienced location manager who's still out there, really experienced. Um, uh, and, and funny note, Michael Mann was doing this pilot that he wrote, it was called Hannah. And it was about a vice cop in LA. And we shot this pilot and it involved you know, blowing up an armored car and all this kind of stuff. And NBC decided they weren't gonna pick it up. Um, and a lot of projects, if they're good, you'll see them again. And just because it didn't work as a pilot, Michael Mann went back to the woodshed and he turned it into a feature um, and uh, called Heat. Um, and that was the same character, Jake Hanna, I think was his name. And it was Al Pacino and Amy Brenneman. And it was the same story. He just didn't let it go. Um, but I was sitting with this, um, my partner, location manager, and told him I wanted to be a production manager because I wanted to make more money and I wanted more responsibility. Um, I really wanted more responsibility. I knew there'd be money that came with it. Uh, and I'm not talking about backing up the money truck, just more money. Um, and he said, well, how are you going to do that? And I said, well, I'm just going to do it. Like, you can't just ask. You have, to, you, you, have to, you have to pivot and probably plant a flag because my experiences and my peers as well um, is that people will keep hiring you for who they know you are or what they know you do. And until you say, thanks very much for the call, but I'm not location and managing anymore, or you know what, I'm available for a couple of days. I'm really trying to production manage. So thanks for keeping me in mind and let me help you out or let me find someone for you. And then ultimately having to draw probably a line in the sand for yourself um, to say, I'm gonna production manage. Um, and I just, every time I take a location manager job, it's not, it's setting me back even though I'm still moving forward, but I realized it was gonna set me back because I wasn't gonna get to where I wanted to go. Um, so I started doing smaller films as a production manager, and then I started doing bigger films um, as a production supervisor because the gatekeepers in our industry for production managers is the Directors Guild. And you can't do studio network television projects or projects with most directors. I mean, there are directors who aren't in the Directors Guild, but 
most are um, kind of tangent years. The Directors Guild was founded to protect, to protect directors' creative rights. Um, and it gives them uh, a lot of protection over their authorship, especially with features, not as much in television. Um, because directors were being taken advantage of by producers and they were not being allowed to tell their story. They weren't being allowed to necessarily cast the actors they wanted. They weren't being allowed to do uh, at least a first pass, a 10 week cut. So the guild got together, all these directors got together, I think in the thirties, it was probably Mary Pickford and a bunch of people and said, we're not gonna work unless you follow our rules and we have this guild, which is a fancy version of the union. So the directors surrounded themselves with people who would help them get their vision. And that's first, first the assistant directors uh, and the production managers. Um, so um, I, um, it took a long time to get qualified to be in the director's guild. You, you need as a production manager, 400 days working, which is, it's not just I have to work for a year and a month or a year and a quarter. It really takes many years to get those many days specifically. Uh, but I saw that as a goal, I saw that as a path and um, you know, I went on it and it was a journey. And along the way, I, I got to do some pretty cool films uh, and that path led me to being um, a, you know, a line producer, producer, executive producer that I am today. That's awesome. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. I, sorry, I'm just thinking about a lot to unpack. I'm sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. I'm. I'm just thinking. <laughs> I liked your uh, your history lesson. I didn't know. I didn't know that about the. Is it the DGA? Is that yeah, like a, yeah. yeah. I listened to the script note, notes podcast. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, yeah, yeah. With John August, and they always talk about like these union things, and it's it always kind of goes over my head, but I'm like trying to learn about it. So I'm just like. Yeah I, I, yeah, I don't know, because I find it very interesting, just like the dynamics and stuff. You know, it, there's, there's a real struggle there because um, artists on all sides have should have the right to do their project any way they want. And um, producers and, you know, there's a lot of writers who want to get their movie made and can't get made at a certain budget level because of maybe the cost of doing projects with union and guild contracts. Um, and they should have a right to be able to make it with the people that want to make it without having to maybe necessarily um, work under those union and guild agreements. The, the challenge starts to become um, most of the time, the really great people that you want are really great because they have a lot of experience and the experience helps make them better in their, in their craft, in their artistry. Um, and most of them get to that place where they say, now that I have enough experience, I can work at a higher level, but I have to join a union or a guild to do that, which isn't a penalty. It actually, it's good for them because they get, they get health insurance in America. That's a big deal. Um, they get money put away for retirement, which is great. Um, and they also know that their, um, their workplace rights are protected, maybe not necessarily as artists, but sort of, um, uh, but for sure that they get protected so they don't have to go in and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're like the, the factory worker version of a desperate actor. We, we need to work, we're freelance. And so I think a lot of people um, um, rely on their union contracts to at least give them a floor to work from so that they don't, they don't give away um, um, maybe kind of sustainability with negotiating a rate. Like when I first took that location manager job, I, I didn't do myself any favor because um, I got taken advantage of. I was happy, but um, I think there are people that in all walks of life that get taken advantage of. And um, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, uh, the union, non-union thing. I think especially in the beginning, um, it's easy to, to, for a lot of people to kind of demonize the union unionization projects because it is definitely a blow on a lot of projects when they get organized. You know, Kevin, Kevin can tell you it's really, a bummer because you put your heart in a place and you think you have all these people who agree with you and then you turn around and um, you get a financial bomb thrown at you. So maybe a different conversation, but it's part of this whole thing of how do you how do you decide where you want to go? Um, and what are you going to pick up along the way? Yeah. Spe uh, speaking of that, I was wondering, uh, so uh, you're a line producer. Um, yeah. But what does uh, what does that role entail? Like if you had to give a I guess, because I'm sure there's probably so many, uh, it's such a multifaceted job. I'm sure you have a ton of responsibilities, but if 
you were to give like a spark notes version of it for you know college students such as myself uh what would you say uh your role is well uh, i i think the easiest analog um analogy that i have is um most people know what a general contractor does you know um if somebody has um, wants to build a beautiful house uh, they go hire an architect they find a piece of dirt they buy that the architect comes up with the vision for the plan um, i think the dirt's a lot like a production company or a studio the architect's a lot like a writer um, and uh, the the studio behind the people that bought the piece of dirt um, is the financier and they say okay now we need someone to execute this and we need to make sure that they're gonna take care of the architect's vision. They're gonna take care of the clients who have to move into this place and live, live in it. And the clients are gonna want, um, uh, they're gonna want aesthetically to be um, satisfied that all the surfaces were, were bought and installed correctly. Um, they're gonna make wanna make sure that it's ready to move in when you say in eight months or 18 months or eight years, the project's gonna finish on time and on budget. Um, so I, I do the same thing. I, I, I get contacted by a studio or a network or my agent, maybe um, a producer, and um, they, they, they see if I'm interested in their project. And usually they pitch, you know, a minute to five minutes of a story and here's who's involved. And it depends how badly they want me, I think. You know, usually the, I always assume they're talking to three to five other people. Um, and, um, They'll, they'll often ask me to read a script and give them um, maybe my impressions or my notes about it. And they'll give me a budget range and maybe a time frame, and ask, you know, how, how do I think that, you know, it can be done? What are some of my ideas, where to shoot it, how to shoot it? Um, usually there's always a bit of alchemy involved. They're, they're looking always to turn some of the lead into some kind of gold because there's never, never enough gold. And, um, we have to come up with something clever. And um, uh, a, a lot of, for, I always think there's, there's, it's important to take kind of an asymmetrical approach a few times when you're talking to new people. Have you thought about making it this way? Have you thought about going to Mexico for two weeks and then coming back to America for four weeks? And, you know, just, just because we all are an echo chamber and you need an outsider sometimes to, to come up with some kind of inspiring idea. Usually from there, I, um, I meet a director and interview with the director. And, and that's a vibe thing. If, uh, I think directors are really worried about being um, paired up with someone who's just gonna grind money and not be fun to be with and not really listening, um, maybe being tone deaf to the vision, to the script. Um, and they really want someone who's gonna support them and um, uh, add, add all sorts of value besides monetary value. Um, for the transaction of making you part of the team, because we are part of a team, you know, we're 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 a big team, and so I then have to help build the whole crew um, with the director, um, find the production designers and the cinematographers and the first ads and that kind of all those department heads, location to shoot in, um, you know, city, state, country. Uh, there's always always finance and compliance and studio bureaucratic calls all day long as well. And then, you know, inspiring and keeping the crew motivated to our start date. My job is to make sure that we can start the movie and finish the movie um, and hand it off to post-production typically um, on time and on budget. I mean, that's that's really the, the, the cold light of day of what I have to do. But the, the difference is um, how I'm gonna do it is might be different than how you would do it. Um, we might get the same results. Um, and that vibe thing is really important. You know, some directors are looking for, or producers are looking for different types of people. Um, and uh, finding that match um, is, uh, is super critical. So, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to, to work a lot, especially these days. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm lucky. And, and I think we're always, um, you have to count on your last job as really kind of a conversation piece. Maybe it's two jobs ago or three jobs ago. A lot of times people haven't seen your last job yet. Like we haven't seen Chloe Zhao's new movie, but we know about it. Um, so like the job I'm working on now, um, a few people that I interviewed with um, certainly had heard, heard of Borat because it was making a lot of noise and that noisiness was great. 
Um, it's tough. Sometimes, you know, you can't pick, you can't pick how they're always going to turn out. Sometimes they're stinkers and you just have to move on. So if you haven't seen speed two, no worries, but I, I worked on that and I, I still, I, I still talk about it to this day because it was, it was really hard to make, but it was a really shitty movie. <laughs> I've seen the first speed and I loved it. I, I have not seen cruise control, unfortunately. <laughs> Every, everything um, that could have gone wrong with an idea did. Yeah, but hey, uh, congratulations on another, on, I mean, Borat, su subsequent movie film. I, I feel like that's the definition of a successful sequel. I mean, Oscar nominations, winning Golden Globe for um, best comedy or musical. Congratulations for all of that. Thanks, that's yeah. great. And Brad Pitt really, really couldn't force himself to say the title in the Oscars the other night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was, yeah, that was Brad Pitt. He couldn't say Maria Bakalova's name, which is weird because he had like six months to practice it. And then he, it, it, then I think he, I think it was Brad Pitt did the writers. I think he did. Somebody, I think it was Brad Pitt. He completely mangled the title. It was so funny. Oh, I'm um, sure. <laughs> and Sasha did the title to torture people, to be clear. I mean, he made, he, he did that to torture the distributors. He wanted to have like Guinness Book World Record title just to torture people, just to have the longest thing on a one sheet. He wanted Amazon to put it on the tape on the boxes when Amazon picked it up and they said, no, it's too long. And he just kept saying, I'm not going to make a deal with you guys if you don't put it on the boxes. I love how the how the title changes throughout the whole movie. First, it's like Gift of Monkey to like Michael yeah. Pence or whatever. <laughs> and then yeah. just keep switching. Oh, it's what, 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 a, what a funny movie. Um, I guess, um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll skip ahead a few questions because I guess Borat kind of came up. Um, I, as a line producer, um, well, I'm just, I'm thinking about a deleted scene that went viral from Borat too, in which uh, Sasha Baron Cohen had to flee from an angry mob in Washington state when he started uh, making fun of them at, at a rally uh, to like jerk COVID. Hold on, um, step down. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So yes, he had to flee. Wuhan flu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that song. Um, I was like, as a line producer, how does your job factor into preventing or like solving a lot of these like dangerous or, and I'm sure that's probably a more dramatic example, but a lot of like potentially uh, harmful situations. I know being on a set, it's like ripe for these sorts of incidents and stuff. How does your job kind of go into that and like prevent these sorts sure. of things from happening? Um, well, first of all, there's nothing like working with Sasha. There's nothing like Borat. There's, I mean, there's it's, 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 it stands alone, you know. Um, uh, you know, having said that, almost without exception, any movie you get on or every TV show, you're never really going to do the same thing over again, ever. Everything's kind of always new, you know. Um, I, I think of Florida Project and none of those people had brought 13 kids or whatever it was to a motel in central Florida. So we're gonna shoot for four weeks um, with their families and with all these people that live in the community here. Um, I know in the beginning they went, how, how are we gonna do this? You know, everything's over. What's that? Oh, um, you know, everything's a, a journey, it's a discovery. And it's part of the team. We all just start to talk about where do we start? How do we start talk about it? So with the case of the, um, it was called the Patriot Pride Rally, I think in uh, Olympia. Um, you know, we had long lead research from our producers that found that event through a bunch of crazy right wing second amendment. Well, it's unfair of me to see crazy, um, but let's assume. Um, Second Amendment uh, uh, rally back in, it was a June a year ago, right? It was 10 months ago. It wasn't even a year ago. Um, and it was long before the same group of people that were involved in Portland um, with the shootings that were happening with the Patriot. Those are the same people, the Patriot Pride people who got shot maybe allegedly by that guy who then got killed by the cops in Lakeview, Washington a month later, right? I mean, he just got like, taken down. Um, so we found this group, we knew it was a second amendment rally. We knew there'd be 500 ish people there. We knew they'd be bringing weapons. Um, they would have ammunition. Um, we knew that they were gonna be mostly assault rifles. Um, so we started with that assumption. 
which is insane for us as producers to think, you know, everything we do is to avoid danger and to make sure that everybody's safe. We have huge safety programs, protocols, stunt people are around to keep the cast safe and the crew safe. Um, we have risk assessment people. Um, we, had, um, we had a couple contractors who did security for us, specifically for, um, for Sasha. Um, they had background in um, you know, Israeli intelligence and security. One of them had background and he still won't even tell me where he works, but it's some JSOC, Navy SEAL, contractor, Blackwater thing. I'm not exaggerating, it's, it's that world. Um, and, you know, they started looking at it from a high level, like, okay, how many people are going to be there? Where are they coming from? And um, it's going to be dangerous. And so we need to then start working on contingency plans to protect our actor and protect our crew. We, we put 10 cameras in there and, you know, we had to kind of dress everybody up so they blend in without having an AR-15 or, you know, um, a Kevlar vest on. Um, and so we practiced how to get the angles. We knew where the stage was gonna be. We'd scout it. We scouted it days before because nobody suspected that we were <laughs> producing a movie. So we could walk around and point at things and get a camera up and, and get the angles. And what time of day is this gonna be? Um, and then, you know, if you go into Twitter and look back at those days, you'll find that there was a lot of spy craft that we did that really misdirected the organizers of the event. We, we realized we could start paying for things um, and they were thrilled. Like we, you know, we offered to pay for extra security um, because we thought they would appreciate that. And they did, um, but they didn't realize the security was for us. Um, so the security we paid for was facing out from the stage, making sure that our actor behind there was gonna be protected. Um, and then, you know, our guys figured out, we'll bring an ambulance for first aid is what we told them. And they said, that's a great idea because, you know, it's a concert, it's been the middle of the day. Um, they didn't realize that the ambulance was, was gonna serve as our getaway car with those lights and sirens going, which was perfect because we got to get out right away. Yeah. So <laughs> we did all this stuff, but not one person came up with it. It was our group. It was, you know, our location person who kind of said, I don't want anything to do with this, but got us the permits. It was our security people, our camera guys, our sound person had to figure out how he was going to wire people. And at the same time, we also had to figure out what are we going to do with all of our um, media assets? Um, how are we going to get them out of there in case somebody gets arrested or tackled or beat up? Because we want to get all the footage. <laughs> it sounds so horrible, but sorry, you're in jail, but we need your, we need your iPhone. Um, and, and so we just had to come up with all of these, if that, then this, what if that, then what? And um, there was no way to be prepared for it other than just start coming up with a plan. That's like, I, I just find that fascinating. I could have a whole talk with you just wondering about how, I mean, I'm sure, I know Gather already did a and a about uh, the production of Borat, um, but I could, I could hear about that for hours because that is just so fascinating to me. Um, but I think we're running a little low on time. So um, I only have a few questions left. Um, you mentioned you worked on a pilot, the first iteration of Heat, of, and you, I, yeah. I know you've worked, which is so cool to me because I love the movie Heat. Um, but I know like you, you've worked on television, you've worked on Dead to Me, which is with uh, Christine Applegate and Linda Cardellini. And then you've worked also a lot in film, obviously. Do you have a preference between one of the mediums? Is there one or... I was just wondering, like, how do they vary? And like, is yeah, yeah, fair, it fair, fair. Um, I got into TV, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. It wasn't TV back then. It was new media streaming because the feature market was really, really getting throttled. Um, probably 15 years ago, I think. For instance, Disney, I think, had five divisions that was making, that was, they were releasing 20 movies a year. You know, 100 movies just coming out of Disney. It was Hollywood Pictures and Disney and um, Buena Vista and yeah, I, I don't know what it was and they started realizing they're spending all this money and um, uh, they're competing against themselves every weekend at the box office they started making less product for more money um, then the ten poles started really taking over the marketplace and uh, a lot of feature 
feature opportunities just started dying. There was no more $30 million dude comedies. There were no more $50 million family dramas. Um, the days of Devil Wears Prada for $80 million were gone. It was just too much money. And uh, a, a lot of that is, is, there's a lot of business inside of that. The, you know, the globalization of storytelling, those things do not translate very well into local language. Um, you know, humor doesn't translate over oceans very well. Neither do concepts of romance or even family issues. They tend to be very, very nation and culture specific. Um, and then technology changed all that overseas too. All of a sudden you could buy a red camera. You, before, before that, you couldn't buy a Panavision camera. You had to rent it, or you might've been able to get an Airflex, super expensive. So there were a lot of barriers to entry to storytelling. Um, so I started realizing what was happening with new media and there were, there were serialized new media shows coming out. There wasn't enough bandwidth to maybe do a half hour, one hour show, um, but they were doing like these seven minute comedy serial shows. Um, and I thought, you know, I should try to do some of those. And so uh, I did, um, and it was great because I got to bring my feature storytelling experience and kind of organizational skills to what was a pretty mad, mad world of, it wasn't super indie, but it was that way. Started doing a lot of experiential stuff, um, big YouTube adventure things, which was, which was great. Um, but what really started happening is it, it, things changed five, six years ago, uh, you know, with that whole house of cards surge and um, uh, Game of Thrones, you know, really turned streaming into something. And um, the good storytellers started coming over into episodic work because, you could turn a okay two and a half hour story into a great 10 hour um, series, you know, or eight hour limited series. Um, but I, what I've found in the last few years is that I'm still, um, I'm still very director centric. I really, really um, am attached to the idea of an auteur. I still don't really bond with the showrunner um, philosophy. Um, you know, the showrunner and the writers control typical episodic work, they bring in directors and the directors are, they're, they're kind of a second thought. They don't really have as much um, creative control as, as you do in a feature world. So what I'm really drawn to in the streaming world, let's not, I won't call it television, is um, um, limited series or series with a single director. Um, so I didn't get to do Big Little Lies, but for instance, you know, they did whatever it was, 10 episodes in 100 days with Jean, I forget the guy's name, French guy. Um, or I did a movie, a, a series called I'm Not Okay With This with Jonathan Entwistle, who's from England, and he did End of the Fucking World. And it was him and me and us, and we took eight episodes, and we, we built it like a movie. I had one director, and we block shot all of the locations and the sets. And it was really nice because... It wasn't noisy, like getting a new director every week or every two weeks. Um, and it really felt like there was a single purpose of the vision. And as a result, we really got to, um, I, think it was, I think it's better for storytelling. If you look at the Queen's Gambit, you know, Scott Frank's an amazing writer. I mean, he wrote out of sight, right? Like crazy, crazy, crazy cool writer. But he also did Godless. And, you know, both of those, he controlled the eight episodes. And his, his vision, I think, really comes through. And it makes it very succinct as a story. So I like doing those with single directors. I like doing features with directors and it's probably, you know, a good fit for me. I mean, Dead to Me is pretty serialized and we do two episode blocks um, with one director for two episodes. And, and that's pretty good because it's not like network television, even though CBS produces it. Um, but it's still a grind. I mean, it's, it's really, that, that serial pace is, um, it's, it's a metabolism that's very different than doing a movie. I'm not as fond of it, honestly. But it's work. It's good work. Yeah. People like it. It's fun. It's hard work. All of it's hard work. There's nothing easy about any of it. Mm -hmm. as, nothing. As much as I love the, the sort of widespread accessibility of streaming and how it's kind of blossomed into like its own art form almost, I do, I do miss the like, the mid the mid budget kind of 50 million stuff you were talking about that you that studios don't really make anymore um yeah I really think that the like i mean i guess they kind of ended like early 2010s but those were uh, those are probably like my favorite kind of movies overall i'd say um but oh well um but i i see where you're coming from um 
So I think I have time for one last question. So I was wondering, as a line producer, what would you say you find most challenging and what do you find most rewarding? Essentially, what are the, what are the pros and cons in, in your mind? Uh, challenging, uh, without a doubt, is just building consensus. It's always, it's all, I mean, that's the coin of the realm with what we do. Getting all these people with, you know, there's all these different stakeholders and we're all getting everybody in sync above the line and below the line. You know, we're all making the same project. Um, it's, it's, it's probably the hardest thing is getting people to unpersonalize their creative issues, to um, recognize that we all um, together have to, to figure out a way to tell the story with um, each other and what we have. Um, and there's a lot of pressure and um, we all handle pressure different ways. And there's moments of inelegance within every one of us. And it's hard. It's super, super hard building that consensus. Um, the longer I do it, the, I think the better I get at it because I've learned not to personalize most of the deficiencies that you run into. Um, they're, they're just kind of facts and you have to figure out like how to solve them. Um, you know, seventh grade algebra, I never knew what I was going to do with solve for X, but I do it every day. Um, I'm not very good at math. Um, you know, I mean, I'm good enough with just logic and probably intelligence, but you know, it's funny. I handle millions of dollars on every project, tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions. And it's pretty crazy. I never took an accounting class, never took an economics class, never, I didn't get past probably geometry, never took pre-calc calculus, nothing, I'm missing out. but I, I understand how things work. You know, I understand, you know, how to put Legos together. And it's the same thing with us. Like you, you, you just have to understand, uh, you know, how things, uh, you know, extrapolate and compile and um, how to get to yes is a big part of it. And that solve for X is always the biggest thing. Like the, the problems are obvious, but how are you going to, you know, solve it? So that's probably the biggest challenge. And, and the, the biggest joy is, um, I always love, the biggest joy is, all for, is still one of them is, is getting hired. Like when, you, when I fight really hard and do a lot of research and I do a lot of research before I interview with people, I wanna know who they are, what I can find out about the story, maybe have an idea of, of what it does, you know? I don't ever wanna walk in a room and just know nothing about the people, nothing about the project. because. I just feel like that's so disrespectful. Like they're taking time out to see if I'm the right person. I should also be seeing if they're the right person. Um, but getting hired is always really fun for a project that I fought for. Um, and also just finishing, finishing, um, finishing a show um, with your head high. Um, I always say it's great if I can make one new friend for my life off a project. You know, not that I couldn't make 10, but it's pretty awesome. You know, you get really close to people. You get really close to strangers. You build a new tribe. It's like a new family. Um, and uh, it, what we do is really, really hard, especially at the leadership level. I mean, it's hard work in the trenches. Um, you know, there's a difference between hard work and working hard. You know, um, I, I think there's working hard might be digging ditches, which is really working hard. But the hard work is figuring out like where to dig the ditches and what the ditches are going to do. Do you know what I mean? And they're both really hard on a person, but the leadership of figuring things out so that you're successful and you can deliver, there's a lot of joy in making that happen and then creating some bonds with some people, um, you know, for the, rest, for the rest of your life on the road to happy destiny, for sure. Like you'll see some of those people again. That's cool. I love that. Yeah. Um, so we actually do have a little bit more time than I thought we did. Um, my bad. Uh, By the way, how much time do we have? Because I should get off. Oh, okay. So, yeah, um, no, no, that's cool. How much time do you want? I don't know. Uh, Kevin, do you have a... Hey, guys, I was going to check back in. We're actually hitting our hour limit. So, um, buddy, I just want to say thank you so much. You know, I, I thought the, um, and Chris, you did a fantastic job. I know we could, we could talk forever, but I wanted to, you know, it's funny, you, you talking about, um, you know, the people that you meet and the connections that you make. And, you know, you were also talking about the unions. I think it's so important for students to get a better understanding, 
you know, of the role that they play. I mean, I think it's, you know, I, when we were shooting so much in LA and we got to know so many of the local crew that we were working with on a regular basis, you know, even on some of the short films we were doing, we'd always try to figure out a way um, to work with the unions and, and people to get their hours. And, and, you know, those things meant a lot sometimes on jobs for people to, to be able to come on and work on something, even if it was for some period of time, a short period of time, because it meant working toward pensions for, you know, or, or their hours for insurance. They got health insurance. They have a pregnant yeah. wife and they got, you know, you get enough hours on union jobs and people can get their health insurance that way. And, you know, thinking about the crew, you think about people like Mario Simon, you know, our transpo coordinator or Jerry Dietz, the key group, you know, we made these friends and, and anyway, it, it's, I, I loved hearing you talk about that because, um, I do think it's something that, you know, people should understand more, you know, you do, um, sometimes there could be challenges with working with the unions, but, but, um, but it's, it's great for the, for the people that we work with. So, um, yeah, there's a place for both for sure. As we both know. Yeah. Oh no, of course. I mean, we could, we could tell stories about that for hours, but I'm super appreciative, man. I, I, you know, it, it, it's really been fun to do these and to hear stories from somebody like yourself, you know, and, and, and to hear the career path. It's so informative for folks to, you know, to know because as people come out of school and they think, how did you get to that place? It's a long road. As we know, it is a lot of hard work. Um, I love the story about Nome, Alaska. That's hilarious about the guy sitting in the warming hut. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. I mean, as you know, we see crazy shit working when you, I mean, just the, you, you, people don't believe the houses you walk into scouting locations. Oh my God. They can't believe the people that are on earth. I mean, in a wonderful way, in a crazy way. You know, it's, we, we're, we're blessed to uh, have a lot of amazing stories from these things, right? I mean, yeah. old, uh, but listen, thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate your time. I love doing these. I love your groups and I'm hope, I hope it makes a difference in the world, you know? No, it's fantastic. I mean, it, it's, can, we continue to get emails from people coming in and checking out the library and hearing them and it's just really great. So thank you so much for it, buddy. And Chris, again, fantastic job. And for people, please check out gatherproject.net for the stuff that we have on our upcoming list. We'll continue to do these through the summer, even as students uh, finish for the school year. So buddy, uh, let's catch up soon, man. Break a leg in Toronto. Thank you. Uh, happy, happy Thank quarter Chris. 10 and happy birthday, buddy. Thank you. And let's catch up soon. Okay. Good job, Chris. Thanks, Kevin. Bye, everybody.